Roman, welcome to Talk Python to me. Hey, hello. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you here. Oh, we get to talk about one of my favorite topics, MongoDB. I'm so excited. Yeah, my favorite topic, obviously, too. <laughs> uh, yeah, you definitely put a lot of time into it. We're going to talk about your ODM. People often hear about ORMs, Object Relational Mappers, but traditionally, MongoDB and other document databases and NoSQL databases haven't modeled things to relationships. It's more through documents. So the D instead of R, ODM, uh, Beanie, which is going to be super fun. It brings together so many cool topics and even relationships. So maybe if you really wanted, I guess you could put the R back in there <laughs> as of uh, recently. Anyway, super fun topic on deck for us. Before we get to that, let's just start with your story. How did you get into programming in Python? Um, I started when I was a student, like more than, more than 10 years ago now. So, But I started not with Python. I started, it was 2008, I think, 2007 probably. Mm -hmm. uh, I started with Flash. And nobody knew that Flash will die soon. <laughs> Flash was so. such a big thing when it was new. <laughs> I remember people were just completely getting amazing consulting jobs and building websites with Flash. I'm like, what is this? I'm not sure I want to learn this, but <laughs> do I have to learn this? I hope not. But yeah, anyway, yeah, it it did kind of get killed by HTML5. And, you know, I think honestly, yeah. maybe it got killed by Steve Jobs, really, or at least earlier Definitely, than it would have been. Yeah. So, but that time I didn't know that, and action script <laughs> two and three were my, yeah. <laughs> right my tools. And yeah. then I decided to 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 move to backend problem. So, Flash is a client uh, technology. If yep. somebody don't know, does know. So, and then I moved to. I just wanted to build websites and wanted to move to backend, and I uh, chose Django. Mm -hmm. Not Python, but Django, because Django was super fancy at that time. And now also, yeah. but at that time, yes. And I was a Django developer, not Python developer, but Django developer for a year, probably, because you know I knew a few tricks and tips about Django tools, uh -huh. and models, views, and etc. cetera, templating. And then somehow I learned Python also. And now I'm more or less good Python developer. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. I think I just realized as you were speaking, we might have to tell people what flash is i feel like it's just one of these you know iconic things out of the tech industry but it might be like talking about alta vista at some point the kids they won't know what flash is they yeah. won't know there was this battle <laughs> about getting this <laughs> thing on people's computer and it was always like viruses are being found in him but it could always do this magical stuff how interesting yeah yeah how yeah. old we are <laughs> <laughs> exactly. The other thing that is interesting is you said you chose Django. You didn't choose Python, which, yeah, I, yeah, I think that that's, you know, now people are often choosing Python because of the data science and computational story. But before 2012, there was not this massive influx of data science people. And I think that the the big influx was people becoming Django developers and like, well, I guess I guess I'll learn Python. Kind of like people becoming Ruby on Rails developers. They're like, I don't know Ruby, but I want to do Ruby on Rails, so I guess I got to learn Ruby. And Django is kind of our version of that, right? Right, yeah. Then then I think Flask appeared after a few years, and everyone started to do microservices with Flask. And after that, <laughs> the game started. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Oh, my goodness. Out in the live stream, we're getting some uh, high fives from Pradvan on Django. And JF says, uh, he says Django right, the right way. Fantastic. <laughs> so awesome. Yeah, and no, I think Django has been massively important for Python and very, very cool. Yeah. How about now? What are you doing day to day? So I'm principal Python developer now. And uh, this is interesting. Actually, I changed my job. Uh, three months ago, mm -hmm. and I didn't uh, look for a new job. But uh, one day, Mahmoud, my current manager, just texted me into Twitter uh, <laughs> that, uh, hey, I saw your library, Bini, and it's interesting. And we need something like this in our project. And probably you would like to participate in and you know uh, integrate Bini into our project and uh, develop Bini at the work oh, time. Cool. And I decided, yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure that's, to. that's amazing. I mean, on one hand, it would just be cool to have a fun job doing cool MongoDB stuff, right? 
on the yeah. other. It's like, oh my gosh, I get to use my library and build up my library in a real production environment. Like that's awesome, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I, I, I decided the same, the same day, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Let me think about it. Uh, yes, okay. <laughs> to figure out how long it takes me to quit my current job. Awesome. Well, congratulations. That's really cool. So yeah, that only means good things for Beanie, right? It only means more time and energy on it, I would suspect. Yeah, yeah. all this, the current release, the huge release uh, is possible only because I, I can work a little bit time on work time, not only you know, mm. on weekends. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's easy to justify. You're like the library needs this feature to work right for us. <laughs> so let me add that feature to the library as just part of the sprint or whatever, right? And also probably it's even more important that when I when I can work on production with Bini, I can also see what what does it need, like yeah. which feature. And, it's so uh, true. Which improvement. It's so true because there's just these little edge cases. They mm -hmm. they don't show up under even a complicated little example you build for yourself. You know you you've got to put it into production. And, and live with it. You know, some of that stuff might be migrations, right? Like, oh, I never need these migrations. Oh, wait, <laughs> we, we have the zero <laughs> downtime promise. We kind of need migrations now or something, right? Yeah, right. Totally correct. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, that's great to hear. Congratulations. Now, I wanted to start our chat off not talking about Beanie precisely, but like a little lower in the tech stack here. Let's just talk about MongoDB for a little bit. I'm a huge fan of MongoDB, as I'm sure many of the listeners know out there. I've been running TalkPython, TalkPython training, those things on top of MongoDB for quite some time. Um, in the very, very early days, some of that was SQL alchemy stuff, but then I, I switched over to Mongo and whatnot. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of it. I definitely think there's a lot of value in it. Um, there's... A lot of these architectures where people talk about, oh, we have a Redis middle tier cache because we got to have our website fast. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> we get 10 millisecond response time and there's no cache. It's just talking to the database because, you know, everything is structured the right way. I, I think it's anyway, I'm, I'm kind of going on too much. But what I wanted to start with was I want to hear your thoughts on just sort of why build on top of Mongo. You know, so many people in the Python space build on Postgres, which is fine. It's a good database and all. It's just a completely different modeling story. So what, why are you interested in Mongo? So um, first of all, Mongo is, is, is super flexible database by design. And I really like to do, you know, to do um, prototypes. So when I just uh, come up with new idea of new project, home project, and etc., uh, it's quite simple to to work with MongoDB instead of uh, Postgres when you have to change uh, painfully schema uh, of your mm -hmm. data. But with Mongo, you you can just you know, do what you want to. And, That's been my uh, experience as well. That. I remember almost every release of my code would ha involve some migration on the SQL Alchemy version. And yeah. I think I've done one, what you would consider a migration in like five years on MongoDB. Whereas everything else is like, I'm going to add a, add this uh, equivalent of a table or I'm going to add a field to this document, but it just it just goes in and it just, it it adapts. It's, it's fantastic. It's like plastic instead of um, something brittle. Ah, even in the indexes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, nice. Yeah, th th that's why it's great for me, I think. Yeah. yeah, it's really easy for prototyping, right? You just, instead of trying to keep the database in sync or whatever, you just work on your models and magic happens. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And then, then for sure, for production, you have to, you have to understand your, uh, so profiling your needs and uh -huh. then you can you can move to Postgres or you move, can move to something like uh, uh, time stamp database like ClickHouse for example yeah but mm -hmm. in most cases Mongo is enough and for some cases Mongo is uh, the best choice because because of flexibility and because of, of many cool stuff like indexes and etc. Yeah absolutely I think 
indexes, I don't know, this is maybe getting ahead of ourselves, but I think indexes are just so underappreciated in databases. I mean, I know a lot of people out there make sure their their queries have the right indexes and stuff in it, but there's also so many websites I visit that take three seconds to load a page. I'm like, there's no way there's an index on this query. There's just no way. I don't know what it's doing, but somebody has just not even thought about it. And if it was a weird little, oh, here's like the reporting page, fine. But it's like the home page or something. You know what I mean? Like, how are they not making this faster? Even in like a Postgres story, right? Like, I, I feel like there's one thing to have a database that does something. There's another to like tune it to do the right thing, regardless of whether it's relational or NoSQL. Yeah, totally correct. Yeah. Yeah. You have a lot of experience with databases. I mean, you, you must have that feeling as well. You go to some website, you're like, what is it doing? Why is this thing spinning? What could it possibly be doing here? <laughs> yeah, probably somebody is going, you know, to get data. And <laughs> to bring exactly. It. I mean, you, you're thinking through the ideas. Okay, is it just not have an index, or is it an n plus one problem with some ORM, or where, where, why am I waiting here? What mistake have they made? <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> All right. Um, so the next thing I want to sort of touch on is this tweet from Scott Stoltzman sent this out yesterday. I don't think he knew that we were coming up uh, with this conversation, actually. So there was this programming humor joke. It says <laughs> it has like a two. I guess one of them is like a kitchen. The other is an office, but it doesn't really matter. Like the kitchen is super organized and it says my <laughs> <laughs> everything's little buckets and put away nice and then there's a desk area that's just it looks like a hoarder house or like a you know uh earthquake hit and destroyed this area and it says manga dv <laughs> and it's actually true <laughs> it, it is it, it can be true and the reason i bring this up is scott said you know i know a guy who made this course um that saved me from this chaos with mongo engine because yeah. it can happen with it can happen in about 15 seconds without a strong plan. And so out of the box, the way MongoDB, the dev folks there suggest that you or at least provide, let's put it that way, the tools they provide for you to work with MongoDB mm -hmm. are dictionaries. Like you can give us dictionaries and put them somewhere and you get dictionaries back. And in Python, dictionaries are just whatever, right? <laughs> There, there's zero structure, there's zero discoverability, there's zero type safety, right? Sometimes it's a string that looks like a number, other times it's a number, good luck, those don't match in a query. You know, like it's horrible. And so for me, I feel like what you need to do when you're working with databases that have less structure in the thing itself, like this says MySQL, I'll say Postgres. Like Postgres says, the table looks like this. This column is that size of a string this is a number and that's it you know like the structure is in the database yeah. where in these document databases the structure is in the code and so you should have some kind of code that helps you not end up in a situation like this right yeah yeah but so honestly postgres also uh, came up with json b fields now and yeah <laughs> so they're kind of maybe they fall into that bottom bucket like in a small little area yeah. So, but but yeah, it's it's also one of the things why uh, schemas about structure. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and so the thing I think saves you from you know uh, Scott mentioned Mongo Engine, which is pretty good, but I think the thing that saves you from this are these ODMs. Like you you have a lot more structure in your class classes and your python layer right yeah yeah correct and uh, and also so yeah bini is uh, odm based on pydentic pydentic is a uh, python library uh, validating stuff so yeah, let me read the little introduction bit here, uh, because I sure. think there's so much in this first sentence. So Beanie is an asynchronous Python object document mapper, ODM, for MongoDB. So ODM we talked about, Mongo we talked about, um, asynchronous. 
Uh, and also, I didn't finish the sentence. Based on Motor, which comes from MongoDB, and Pydantic. So it's also asynchronous, right? Which is yeah. pretty yeah. awesome, as in async and await. And so often, the models that we build for the databases are their own special thing. And then you got to build maybe an API and you might use Pydantic or something like that. But Pydantic has been really coming on strong as a super cool way to build object um, trees and object graphs and stuff. And so Pydantic is a perfect thing to say, well, let's just use that. Everyone already knows how to use that. And things like APIs can already exchange those on the wire. Yeah. 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 So, and uh, th that's why, that's why I chose this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I, it's just such a neat combination of bringing the async and await stuff together uh, along with Pydantic and saying, let's see if we can use those ideas for the, the basically for the ODM. So there's other ones, you know, Scott mentioned Mongo engine. That's actually what I'm using right now for my MongoDB stuff in Python. Uh, it's Mongo engine is pretty good. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like it's kind of uh, wherever it's going to be. There's not a there's not a ton of excitement in terms of like new features and pushing stuff forward. For example, there's uh, to my knowledge, there's no async and await stuff happening in there. And there's yeah. there's um, I think it's synchronous. Um, possibly there's some something that's happened that's changed up. But the last time I looked, it was synchronous still. Um, Weeks ago, it was synchronous, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's much <laughs> more recent than I've looked. And what are some of the other ones? Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other MongoDB ODMs out there. I know in the NAS languages, probably, mm. uh, like Mongoose in JavaScript. Yep. Uh, yeah. Actually, for record stuff for Ruby and mm -hmm. things like this. Yeah, yeah. So... The, a lot of these systems were based on the Django ORM model. So, for example, like Mongo Engine is basically Django ORM, but adapted for documents in Mongo, right? Like the, the terminology and everything is quite similar. Being based on Pydantic, yours is a little bit different, right? I feel like there's a lot of interesting things you've choices you've made. Uh, one, to be based on Pydantic and how that works, but two, We'll get into the API and stuff, but when you look at the API, I feel like you've chosen to be very near MongoDB's native query syntax or query language. So for example, instead of doing a select, you would do like a find or find one or um, the updates uh, and set, like a set per operator mm -hmm. is one of the things you can do, like a set a value um, on there. Was that conscious to decide, like I'm gonna try to be really close to MongoDB or what was the thinking there? So uh, yeah, uh, when I when I started to to work on Bini, it was not Bini; <laughs> it was just a side project. Because so yeah, on the very beginning, I started to play with Fast API. It was a mm -hmm. very modern uh, web framework that time. Now it's still modern and great frame, web framework, yeah. but at that time it was quite new, around a few years ago. And this is asynchronous also, and uses Pydantic under the hood. Mm -hmm. And there were no ODM, no async ODM uh, for Python and MongoDB. Yeah. And I decided... I had, so the, I had the I, same um, experience. Like, I wanted to use MongoDB with some fast API stuff. I'm like, there's not a great, yeah. great yeah. library that I can pick here. So, well, I guess I'll just use uh, SQL Alchemy or something, right? And what I did, I just... Uh, I just uh, Started with Pydantic, and uh, I've got uh, Motor. Mm -hmm. It is a um, Mon PyMongo. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, this is an engine over uh, PyMongo, and uh, it is a synchronous engine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about Motor a little bit because I suspect that most people who work with MongoDB work with PyMongo. Right. When I yeah. talk, when I opened the conversation, I said the tools they give you are just here's a dictionary to put in, and then I get dictionaries back out. I was exactly thinking of the PyMongo library, yeah. right? And so, yeah. what's this motor thing? This is also from MongoDB. This is also from MongoDB, right? And uh, it's also re it reflects each uh, method and function from uh, PyMongo. 
but it uh, converted, let's say, into a synchronous method and uh, function. Uh, so it uses the same, mostly the same uh, syntax as MongoDB itself uh, and as PyMongos. Okay. Um, yeah. So it's a lot like PyMongo. It says um, motor supports nearly every method PyMongo does, but motor methods that do network IO are coroutines. So async and yep. await type of things, right? And yep, yep. yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And uh, what I did, I just combined together uh, Pydentic and Motor without any. Um, Query builder stuff and uh, you know and other mm -hmm. other ODM fancy stuff. Just querying using dictionaries, the same dictionaries as uh, Motor do uh, does, and by uh, Mongo for models and nothing more. Small library. Uh, it wasn't yeah. been at that time. It was an internal project just to play with fast API. And then after a few months of working, uh, I decided probably probably I can make it open source. <laughs> I yeah. came up with the uh, name Bini. So, and that's why, that, mostly that's why uh, I'm following uh, MongoDB naming, not um, not select, not uh, join, etc. Just uh, find many, find one, uh, mm -hmm. update, uh, and etc. Because because I'm using, I started to use uh, directly motor functions inside of Pydentic stuff. So. Cool. And only after that, I, I just started, you know, to to update Bini stuff with, 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 with more fancy stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was a pretty close match to like, how do I take motor and just make it send and receive Pydantic instead of send and receiving straight dictionaries, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, so the first project was just a parser from motor to Pydantic and back. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, I think it's really neat. And I... You know, however you got there, I think it's really nice that you have the API that matches that because then I can go to the MongoDB documentation and or I can find some other example that somebody has on well, here's how you do it with Pi Mongo. And you're like, well, that looks really close to the same thing over here. So <laughs> uh, we can talk about that. Now uh, I want to dig into some of the other features and stuff there. Um, for example, uh, data and schema migrations and support and whatnot. That's pretty cool. Yeah. But let's talk about modeling mm -hmm. data here. That's, you know, the first letter in ODM, <laughs> the object bit. So what does it look like? I, I know, well, maybe not everyone listening knows what it looks like to model something with Pydantic. So maybe we could give us a Pydantic example, and then we could talk about how to turn that into something that can be stored in MongoDB. So yeah, um, Pydantic is base model. Uh, the main class of Pydantic is base model, and mm -hmm. you inherit everything from base model. And it's like, it looks like data classes of Python, but it also uh, supports validation and parsing. Data and, and yeah, and the, the conversions and stuff is really cool. Um, that's one of the things I think Pydantic is so good about. Um, if you yeah. if you look at their example, um, the way you define these classes is you have a class and you just as a sort of class level, not instance level, you'd say name colon or variable colon type, variable colon type. So in this example, you've got a category, say name colon stir dic uh, description colon stir and then this just means this thing has two fields they're both strings but the pydantic example on their website has got uh, some kind of model where it's got a multiple fields and one of them is a list of things mm -hmm. that are supposed to be numbers and if you pass it a data and that list happens to have a list of strings that can be parsed to numbers it'll just convert it straight to numbers as part of loading it it's really really nice right yeah, yeah, this great feature. Yeah, this exchange across, especially across either files or API boundaries, right? Somebody writes some code and they send you some data. Well, if they didn't really use the native data type, but it could be turned into it, then yeah, that's really and nice. You right? also can uh, add your own parser, like your own validation step, mm -hmm. uh, and then it will it will convert with your rule, like from string to to number. To right. 
So yeah, and Bini uses the same uh, the same schema, the same so document is a main class of Bini and it's inherited from uh, identity base model and it inherits all the methods, all the aspects of uh, base model of Pydentic. So it can use the same validation stuff, uh, the same parsing stuff, and uh, et cetera. Right. So whatever people know and think about Pydentic, that's what the modeling looks like here. I guess the one difference is when you talk about, when you model the top level documents that are going to be stored and queried in MongoDB, you don't drive from base model, right? Drive from something else. Yeah, yeah from, from document. Right. And document, it comes from Beanie, but that document itself is uh, derived from base model ultimately, right? So it, even, even though you got to do this little more specialized class, it's still a Pydantic model in its behavior, right? Yeah, yeah, correct. That's why you can you can use it as a, a response model, for example, in FastAPI, if you're familiar with, yes. because it, it uses uh, Pydantic base models. And sub sub models of uh, base yeah. If, if people haven't seen that, let me. Uh, here's an example. One of the things you can do with Fast API that's super super neat is you can go and say, um, as part of returning, uh, where is this here? As part of returning the values out of the the API, one of the things you can do in the decorator is you can just say the response model is some Pydantic class. And if you just add that one line and that, that class happens to be a Pydantic model, you get all sorts of live documentation and API definition stuff. And there's even code that will consume that. So I built this little weather thing in fast API for one of my classes over at weather.talkpython.fm. If you just go to slash docs, it pulls up, well, here's all the... Uh, all the APIs you can call, and here's like the return value with you know exactly what the schema is, and all of that's just from that one line of code. So what you're saying is you could do that with these database models. You could just say, I'm going to return this directly from my API back to you. And if you just say response model equals your data entity model, you get all this for free, right? Yeah, it's also will validate it based on this model. Like if you, for example, using some external source of data and they changed uh, schema and you received it and uh, responded back. And if uh, the format is not correct, it just will raise an error and you can gracefully handle this, yeah? Nice. Yeah, the error that it returns is also meaningful. Like the third entry in this list cannot be parsed to an integer rather than you know, 400 invalid data. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've modeled these uh, objects in here. And I guess one more thing to throw in while we're talking about modeling. In your example, right at the bottom of the GitHub page, you have a category which has the name and description, and you have a product that has an, its own name and description, and then a price, and it, the product has a category, and here you just say colon category, right? And that would make, I guess, would make this, in, in this case, an embedded document inside of the product document, right? Yeah, totally correct. It will just create embedded document. It's... Yeah, so the way that you model, it, this is why Pydantic's a really good match because Pydantic allows you to compose these Pydantic models in this like hierarchy. You can have like list of other Pydantic models within a Pydantic model, which is exactly the same modeling you get with document databases like Mongo, right? Yeah, yeah. So you don't have to do anything. You're just like it just it keeps modeling the things I wanted to model. Cool. Um, in other database systems like SQL Alchemy or something, you would be able to say this field is nullable uh, or not, or it's it's required or something like that. So how do you say that in this model? If it's nullable, yeah, I can just use Python uh, typing optional. It's not a class, but optional, uh, optional. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mark it as like optional. Uh, and, uh, like optional bracket stir yeah. versus just stir, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I guess for a default value, you just set it equal to its default value, right? Uh, if it's, yeah, yeah, you're right. But if it's optional, so it's uh, explicitly uh, marked here, but Pydantic uh, allows you to use optional without default value and default would be none. 
in that case. Because pedantic is I'm thinking smart, like so. a false or or none or something like that. Um, in this case, you probably wouldn't make it optional. You would just give it a default value, right? Yeah, correct. Now, one of the things that I can do and say Mongo engine mm -hmm. is I can say the default is a function because maybe this is incredibly common for in my world is I want to know when something was created. You know, when did this user create an account? When was this purchase made? When did this person watch this video or whatever? Mm -hmm. And so almost all of my models have some kind of created date type of thing. And the default value is date time dot date time dot now without parentheses <laughs> you know like i want you to call the now function when you do an insert how would i model that in beanie you can use again you can use pedantic stuff here so i'm really like pedantic they did half a fork <laughs> you can <laughs> yeah. use fields class equal field and inside of that you can use a default factory uh, parameter where you can just provide function you you want to okay and so, yeah. Oh, that's right. So you can, instead of setting it, like you could say it's a string, but in, its value is, um, what is it? If you say a field factory or something, you set it to be one of these things that Pydantic knows about. Mm. Didn't get you, sorry. Yeah, so what, um, so mm. like, is that thing that I'm setting it to equal to, does that come out of Pydantic? Like that's not a beanie thing? It, it's this this is pedantic stuff here yeah, uh, default factory stuff but mm -hmm. there is interesting bini feature about this uh, i i can show you in another in another code example here um, for example if you want to use not created at uh, field but updated at so and each sure. time when you update uh, you want to update uh, time and mm -hmm. for that case, uh, default factory will not work because default right. factory. It's already got a value. Yeah, it's only on create. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and Bini allows you to use uh, event based actions for this. Uh, mm -hmm. And you can just create a method of the class. And uh, they are marked it like um, uh, bef run before event before event decorator yeah mm -hmm. uh, before event and uh, inside of this you can just uh, write your logic like uh, self updated at field equals uh, current time and it will work uh, for events you you will choose like insert replace and anything else yeah this is one of the new features we're going to talk about some of the new things but one of them are these these event actions so you can say before the insert event or before the save event happens or after the thing's been replaced or any of those types of things, you can sort of put a decorator and say, run this function when that happens on this type or in this collection effectively, right? Yep. Very, very cool. All right. We're going to dive back into that because that's good. And so that would be actually a pretty good way, wouldn't it? Just do an event an event on insert and when on insert mm -hmm. happens set my created date to be date time dot now yeah okay good good and then i guess the other part that's interesting now is doing queries and inserts on this so you would create your objects just exactly the same as you would pydantic right just class name key value key value key value like that um oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, or, or, or even parse object like uh, category dot parse object and uh, dictionary with values. And yeah, if you, if you mm -hmm. want to parse more right, than one object. Coming, okay, or if it's coming out of an API or something like that, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And then you would say, here's where it gets interesting. You say await object dot insert <laughs> or await um, class dot find one, right? Or await set uh, some value there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because this is a think await library, so that's why you have to use await here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, <laughs> based on based on the synchronous nature of the library. Sure, and that's the whole point, right? Is that it's built around that. I think. I mean, there's ways in which you could use it in asynchronous situations right you could always create your own event loop and just run the function and just block right that way or um, use something like unsync which maybe we'll touch on a little bit later but yeah so but if you're doing something like flask or fast api where the functions themselves the 
thing calling by being called by the framework is already handling it. It's basically no work, right? You just make an async method and then you just await the things and you get this, you unlock this scalability right there. Yeah, yeah. I think modern Python world is pretty everywhere asynchronous already. I, I, I don't know if I think framework development now, like most of them are already asynchronous. I mean, yeah, web exactly. Frameworks. Yeah, so with I think with Flask, there's limited support for async. And then if you want full async, you have to use court for the moment, but maybe stuff's happening. I know Django is working on an async story as yeah. well. I think the big holdup for like full on async in Django has actually been the Django ORM. So, you know, this <laughs> this would fix that. Although, does it make any sense to use Beanie or another ODM or something like that out with Django? Or I mean, it's so tied into its ORM itself, right? I think for Django, it's it's a little bit mm, tricky. Probably, yeah. probably things changed, but uh, Django works with. Uh, mm, Relative databases, yeah, with SQL databases, and also the Jenga model stuff uh, picked yeah, to, to exactly. this kind of. So, and uh, it will be, it's possible, definitely it's possible, as it's Python, everything is possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just, you know, if you're fighting against the system, yeah. then <laughs> you maybe should just choose a different framework rather than try to fight the way that it works, right? Like, if you're going to choose something like Django that gives you a lot of um, opinion, needed workflow but a lot of benefit if you stay in that workflow then just you know i'd say follow that but the other frameworks are pretty wide open right you could easily use this with uh, flask you could use this with um pretty much anything it's better if it supports async right there's not a synchronous version is there yeah there is no synchronous version of this as it uses uh motor insight as, as we said I'm thinking about at uh, you know uh, by Mongo support without motor, and in that case, it would be just synchronous. I, I would think that would be great, honestly. Um, I I'm very excited that this is async first. I think that's really good. But you know, so let me give you an example. So for my website, I would love to be able to make all the view methods be async. Mm -hmm. Right, that would give it a little bit more scalability. It's it's pretty quick, like I said, but you know it would still be way more scalable if it could do more while it's waiting on the server. But at the same time, I have all these little scripts that I run, mm -hmm. and like here's how I want to go, and just show me all the, you know, show me all of the podcast episodes that, and what who is sponsoring them to make sure that if I had to reorder things. I don't mess up some sponsorship detail or show me all the people who have signed up for this class this month and, and whatnot. Those little scripts, right? It would be nice if I could just say these little things are going to be synchronous because it's the easier programming model. <laughs> I don't have to deal with this loop stuff, but then keep the website using the same models in the async version. What do you think of that? Yeah, yeah, I do. I do agree totally, but I have limited time. That's why. I, I mean, I... <laughs> yes, no, of course you do. And uh, I guess that pull requests are, are accepted or, you know, uh, contributions <laughs> are accepted if there's like meaningful good work, right? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, cool. No, I'm not su not suggesting that it's like a super shortcoming, right? It's it's not that hard to create an async method and just call asyncio.run on it. But having this ability to say, this situation is really is a synchronous one. Um, don't need to to go through the hoops to make that happen. I, I, even I had this situation in, in in the past, you know, and I had to create a loop inside of synchronous function. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and you know, stuff. I I think that's worth touching on a little bit because people say that async and await is like what's the uh, it's like a, a virus or something like once one part of your code base gets async, like it sort of expands upward so that yeah. anything that might touch that function itself has to become async and then its callers have to become async and, and so on. And I, you know, in the most naive, straightforward way, that's totally true, mm -hmm. but that it's not true <laughs> if you don't want it to be right, like halfway through that function, that uh, call stack, you could say on this part, I'm going to create an async IO event loop and just run it and just block. Yeah. <laughs> right. And anyone who calls that function doesn't have to know it's async IO. Right. Yeah. 
yeah. you can you could sort of stop that that async propagation. And that sounds like that's what you're talking about, like call it, creating a loop and running it inside of a synchronous function. Yeah, I mean, but but this looks really super ugly. Like yeah, you, you're like, you, you, you even don't have any uh, chance to to avoid this. <laughs> <laughs> creating task. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is a little bit weird if you haven't seen it. I okay, so it's time for my requisite required shout out to the unsync library, <laughs> which I think is just so neat in the way that it simplifies async and await in Python. Um, we were talking about this just a little bit before I hit record, but it it has basically two things that our frustrations that make this kind of stuff we're talking about a little bit harder. Like one, wouldn't it be nice if you could just call an async function and it just runs? Like, I want to write this to the log, but let's do that asynchronously and just go. Go right to the log. I, I don't want to see from you again. I want to hear from you again. Just go put it in the log. I'm going to keep on working, right? You can't do that with Python's async. You've got to like put it in the loop and make sure the loop is running. Um, so this fire and forget model doesn't work. And the other is you can't block, you can't call dot result and to make it block. If it's not done, it's going to throw an exception, right? So yeah. this unsync thing lets you put an at unsync decorator on an async method. And then if you need to stop the async propagation, you just call dot result and it'll block and then give you the answer <laughs> until it's done. And there's all the sorts of cool integration with like threads plus async IO plus multiprocessing. It's, I think this fixes a lot of those like little weird edge cases. I think I will try this after after this podcast and yeah. uh, we'll create a page on the documentation. So if you need, synchronous. yeah, try it out and see if it's a good idea. It might not be a good fit, but I think it is actually. I think it would be. I, I will try. So if it will not work, I will not. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, the way it works is it create when it starts up, it creates a background thread yeah. that only its only job is to run an async IO event loop. And then when you do stuff, when you call functions on this, instead of running the main thread, it just runs on that background thread. And when you block, it just waits for that background thread to finish its work and stuff like that. So it's that's sort of the trick uh, around it. But super big fan of unsync. I think it's it, it does a lot of good for these situations that we're talking about where you're like, okay, almost all the time and definitely in production, I want it async. But every now and then I want it to just stop. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah. So let's talk about some of the other features. Back to this um, example here. There's one thing I wanted to highlight that I think was really neat that I saw. So you've got the standard. I've created an object that goes in the database, and I call insert, and I await that. That puts it in the database, right? Yeah. Um, does so? I don't see a return value here. Does that actually set the ID on this? this thing that's being inserted yeah. after that function call? It, it, it updates this okay. Tony bar Perfect. object. Yeah, so dot ID is, is good to go after that, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. And then the other one, you've got your await find one. The filter syntax is the first thing I wanted to talk about, which I think is really nice. So Thank you. even though the, the um, these things are... Does it have to be one of these indexed ones, or can it be? Can you do these queries on of this style on any of these? Could I like do a category or a description equal something, or a name equal something? Yeah, yeah, sure. You can do it with everything, and you you can you can do it even in the same uh, in the same line in find one uh, price less than ten uh, comma and uh, name equals I don't know your name. <laughs> yeah. So and it will work. Nice. Um, so the way that you would say, I want to find the product or all the products, uh, that is, has a price less than 10 is you just say, in this case, the product is a class with a price field You say product dot price less than 10, right? Just yeah. like you would in an if statement or a while loop or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. This is really nice because, uh, the alternative is something like what you have in Mongo engine, where what you would say is you would say price underscore underscore LT <laughs> equals 10, Yeah. right? So you, you would say like separate the operators on the field with double underscores. And so LT means less than, and then you equal the value you want it to be less than. And that is entirely not natural. It's not horrible. You can get yeah. used to it, but it sure isn't the same as price less than 10, right? Yeah, that yeah. is really nice. 
on the, on the very beginning, when I, when I talked that I, I was Django developer, not Python developer, it was about this. <laughs> because I, 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 I knew how to do this stuff about Django, but it, it's it's not Python uh, syntax, honestly. It's, it's, it's Django syntax, which moved <laughs> to. <laughs> exactly. So you can do these natural queries, you got like less than, greater than, equal, not equal to, and so yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for if it was none, I mean, is thing is none is the most natural way, but you would just say equal equal none. Is that how you would test this? Yeah, you you, you cannot hear, so it's it's not supported to to use is. That's fine. Uh, you, you can use only equal. <laughs> it's better than underscore. <laughs> you know, price yeah. equals ten or equals <laughs> none. Um, just as a, an assignment, that's that's even weirder. So that's cool. Then the other thing that I thought was neat is. So often in these ORMs, and it is worse in the Mongo story because each record that comes back represents more of the data, right? In this case, you've got a, a product and the product has a category, whereas those might be two separate tables in a relational database. So the problem is I get one of these objects back from the database. I make a small change to it, like I want to change the name. Mm -hmm. And then I call save and it's going to completely write everything back to the database, <laughs> right? It's yeah. going to overwrite everything, which can be a big problem. So you've got, there's a couple of solutions you have for that. And one is you have the in place update operators yeah. like set. And I'm guessing, do you have like increment and decrement and um, add to set and those kinds of things? Yeah. Yeah. Literally everything from which MongoDB supports. Yeah. Right. So in this case, you can say, um, product dot set and then product name is gold bar, <laughs> right? Rather than uh, what it was it before it was Tony's or something like that, right? Yeah. And that'll do a MongoDB, you know, dollar set operation, which is an atomic operation. So somebody else could be updating, say, the category at the same time, mm -hmm. sort of transactionally safe. And so this way, you're both way more efficient, and it's also safer that. Um, you're not possibly overriding other changes. Yeah, yeah, and uh, also in in current version, uh, it's possible to so Bini tracks all the changes of the object, and when you call instead of set, you can call uh, save changes, uh, and it will call set inside for all the changes which was happened with uh, with this. Object. Yeah, this was the other way that I was hinting at, and it's it's super cool. Where is this save changes? There we go. So on all of these documents, you can optionally have an, a class, an inner class called settings, and then you can do things like use state management equals true, and you don't have to figure out how to write those set operations or increment operations or whatever. You can just make changes and call save changes, and off it goes, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's, <laughs> it's I like this. Simple. This is, yeah, this is really, really cool. Um, so I, I like that about this, that it gives you that op option to sort of use the most natural way of making very small changes to the data, right? Because so often ORMs and ODMs are give me the object back and make a change to it, put the whole thing back wherever it came from, you know? Yeah, yeah, do agree. And, uh, and also, uh, if you if you don't want to fetch object at all, and you want to set something to to object, you can use update query here, right? Yeah. From, mm -hmm. And you will not even uh, fetch object into your application. That's a so really that's good point because so often with ORMs and ODMs, the the set based behaviors are super hard to do, right? Like, let's suppose I've got a um, hundred thousand users, and I want to go and you know, set some field to like a default value that didn't previously exist in the database, or I want to compute something that's a computed field that wasn't previously there. So I've got to go to each one and make a change or, or something. Um, if it's always the same value, you still would need to go in the ORM stories, like do a query, get the 100,000 records back, <laughs> loop over them, <laughs> set the little one value on the class and call save. But what you're saying is you could just do like, product if, or in my case users dot update value equals what you want it to and just update all of them right update yeah. many you might have to call or something like that right oh you can even find something and then dot update 
and uh, it will it will update on only. Um, oh, really? So you could do like a find all, then a dot update, and yeah. it wouldn't actually yeah. pull and them it, back from the database. It, it will not fetch them. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay. Little bit magic. That's very <laughs> magical. That's awesome, actually. <laughs> Then again, the other things you have on here that are really just simple is like you can do a find uh, and then just a to list on it. <laughs> You're like, I, I don't want to loop over it or, or what I just give me the list back. That's also nice. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. How are we doing on time? Uh, we're getting a little short on time. Let me let's talk through a little bit of some. There's a really nice tutorial here that starts out with defining documents, setting up the code, which is pretty much just standard mongodb right like yeah you have to create one of these clients but what you're really creating is just a motor client so i'm guessing you can send as like complex of a mongodb configuration as you need to and it doesn't affect beanie yeah and also now it's not documented yet because i'm lazy but uh anthony show you mm -hmm. you know him i think anthony shaw makes common appearances here yes <laughs> yeah uh, suggested me to add a uh, optional so you can pass a uh, connection string instead of all this stuff with database just in it bini and connection string and it will work nice uh, so but okay. I have to have documentation about this because sure so in the documentation you create a motor client and then you pass the client over uh, to Beanie uh, init, or uh, you just create the client first, right? But if you just call Beanie, uh, init Beanie with the, the right connection string, it'll do that behind yeah. the scenes for you. Yeah, thanks, Anthony. <laughs> That's really good. So, um, but if you're working with like sharded clusters and replica sets and all the kind of stuff that is like on the outer edge of these use cases, um, it, that should be supported, right? It's yep. just under um, behind the scenes. You don't have to know about it. The other thing that's interesting is when you initialize it, you pass it all the the document classes, like product or user or whatever, right, as a list. Yeah, yeah, because you have to. So under the hood, uh, document must to know to which uh, database it's picked because. So in, for some use cases, you can use different databases in the same yeah. application. And in that case, you have to init bin for different databases uh, with different set of models. So yeah, you, 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 you have to pass uh, models there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do that in mine. I have multiple databases, um, like logging and analytics and all that kind of stuff goes to its, to one database that gets <laughs> managed and backed up less frequently because it's like gigs and gigs of data but you know if you lost it the only person who would care in the world is me be like ah, i lost my history of <laughs> stuff right <laughs> as opposed to the thing the, the website needs to run or user accounts or whatever like those need to be backed up yeah. frequently and treated really specially so i actually have those as two separate databases um based on classes so i guess what you're saying here is you can also call init beanie on multiple times with different databases and different yeah. lists of documents yeah yeah okay. and it will work <laughs> nice yeah that's really cool can you give it um like a star type of thing like everything in this folder <laughs> in this module or this uh, sub package? uh not yet unfortunately but it's nice feature. I think yeah, it, it yeah sounds like a feature request. Yeah. <laughs> okay, sounds like a feature request. Yeah. So <laughs> if you could give it something like, all my models live in this sub package of my project or in this folder. Like, there you go. That that might be nice. Because I, you know one of the things that happens to me often is I'll for, I'll add like a view to some part of my site and I'll forget to register it <laughs> somewhere. Like, why is this a yeah. four or four? Like, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to go and make sure the thing can see this file. Yeah, it it will raise an error, an exception uh, earlier than then you will then you will call any endpoint. Like if nice. you if you if you will try to touch any document without initialization, it will raise an error. Yeah, cool. So let's see. Uh, let's talk indexes. I started our conversation with my utter disbelief that there are websites that take five seconds to load. And I'm like, I know they don't have more data than I have. <laughs> I just know they have done something wrong. There's no way this has more data. Uh, so indexes are critical, right? What is the index story? How do you create them over here? 
it's an interesting story about Linux, honestly. Like I published my uh, so first version of Bini, and one guy uh, texted me that <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably it's possible to add indexes there. I don't see if it's, it's supported or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And in a few days, I added them. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We covered uh, Beanie when it first came out on Python Bytes. I'm like, this is awesome, but where are the indexes? <laughs> I'm a bit of a stickler for those. That's awesome. So yeah, the way you do it is instead of saying uh, when you define a class, say the type is, say, a stir you, or an int, you would say it's an index of int. And that uh, that just creates the index. And it looks like you, you know, in Mongo, you have all these parameters and control. Is it a sparse index? Is it a uniqueness constraint as well? Uh, is it ascending? Is it descending? And whatnot. And so you you can pass it additional information like that it's a, a text index or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah, it supports all the parameters. And, and yeah. uniqueness. This isn't super important, right? Like, you know, your email on your user account had better be unique. Otherwise, a reset password is going to get really weird. <laughs> Um, you support multi-field indexes, which is something that's pretty common, uh, like a composite index. If I'm going to do a query where the product is in this category and it's on sale, <laughs> you want to have the index take both of those into account to be super fast, right? So you have support for that? Yeah, it supports also, but it's not that neat, let's say. It's not that beautiful, but it supports it. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, the payoff is worth it. And it's... Um, it's also in this class called collection, right? So it's it's kind of in its own special inner class of the model, in which case, you know, a lot of the IDs have a little chevron. You can just collapse that thing and not look at it anymore, right? Um, yeah. So it's easy to hide the complexity, I, I guess, there. Yeah, yeah. Cool. All right, uh, what else? Aggregation. It sounds like that well, when we talk about have to get to it pretty quick when we talk about relationships and stuff you said that it's this is super efficient because it's using the aggregation framework so mongodb has like two ways to query stuff right it's like the straight query style mm -hmm. and then it has something that's honestly harder to use but more flexible called aggregations and so you guys support you, your library supports aggregation queries as well right yeah, yeah, right. And also, as as before with updates, it also supports uh, find queries together with aggregations. Like you can you can use uh, like an example. For example, there are some um, presets of aggregations, like average mm -hmm. here, and you can use this average with find queries together, and you will you will see the result. And also for sure, you can pass a list pipeline in MongoDB terms. You can uh, pass pipeline of your aggregation steps uh, there, <laughs> and it will work. Yeah. It's not super easy to write if you haven't done it before, but yes, it will work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and also, the thing is, uh, with aggregations, you you have to set up uh, what schema of the result would be, because with find, everybody knows it would be the same schema of the document, of the original document. Yeah. But with aggregations, it definitely can be any schema of, of results. Right, because the whole point of aggregation, and other people might know something similar with MapReduce, is I want to take, say, a collection of sales, and I want to get a result of, show me the sales by country and the total sales for that country, right? So you're not going to get a list of sales back. You're going to get a, a thing, a list of things that has a country and a total sales, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that's why. That, so you can, for sure, it's optional, and you cannot uh, pass project, project, so yeah, output model, and in that case, it will return dictionaries, but it's not that fancy, so it would be yeah. better to, to. Yeah, this is super it. cool. I love this projection model idea. Mario out in the audience says, "I created a model loader." Speaking of the re passing the documents to Beanie in init, I created a model loader as a utility function that pulls dot separated pass and then passes it to document models. Works really well. Great. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> right on. Uh, so let's talk about relationships because I started out talking about you don't use the R, you use the D because you model documents, not relationships. Yeah. And yet um, Beanie supports relationships. 
This is pretty cool. I'm super excited about this. Yeah, tell us about this. Yeah, uh, so it, it took around three months to come up how to do relations. I mean, MongoDB doesn't support relations <laughs> itself. Uh, but um, relations is a very popular feature in ORM and ODMs, and uh, I had to implement it finally. So, and uh, I did it. Uh, for now, it's supported limited version of uh, relations, like only top level fields are supported and only two uh, kinds of relations like uh, direct uh, relation and list of relations. Right. A one-to-one -one or a one-to-many, I guess. One-to-one, one-to-many, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, and uh, so uh, the syntax is Pythonic, I'd say. It uses ge generic class link uh, inside of bracket, of square brackets, you pass your document right so maybe you would specify normally you would say an optional int <laughs> here you would say like link int and that yeah. might int doesn't make sense but you know that type thing would be the relationship right it's like the same syntax is optional basically here yeah 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 it's it's a little bit tricky and with a black magic uh under the hood <laughs> but <laughs> as long as i don't have to know about it thanks for creating the black magic so you could say here your model is there's a door in a house and then the door is of type link of door and then you have another one that you have windows uh, where the house has many windows and you would say the windows is a list of link of window yeah. which is it's a little bit uh, intense on the <laughs> nesting there but it's not bad right it's just it's a list of relationships yeah 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 and for sure it's possible and i think later it would be uh, implemented i will you know shorten this list of link to to another um... <laughs> links <laughs> links <laughs> no just kidding. don't do that <laughs> although it'd be kind of awesome uh, as a syntax i think it would be less discoverable <laughs> So yeah, and, uh, and it works. You can insert uh, data inside of these uh, linked documents to linked collections, and uh, you can fetch data from linked collections. And uh... yeah, and you can even have it cascade things. So for example, you could have create a house object and say dot windows is this list of window objects, mm -hmm. and then you would say house dot save, and if you pass the link rule. Um, then that says write the and cascade the changes. It'll also go and insert all those windows and associate them, right? Yeah, correct. And uh, I, I didn't use cascade term because it's not a SQL database and yeah, a yeah, little yeah. bit, little bit different uh, <laughs> things sure. outside. Uh, I mean, I mean, with relations, it would be completely different. And yeah, how does this look in the database itself? So. If I go to MongoDB and I pull up the house, what is in its windows? Is that a list of the IDs of the window objects, or what is that? In MongoDB, there is a special uh, data type uh, called ref ID. Okay. It's under the hood. It's it's binary uh, data type, but under the hood, it's a combination of um, ID of the document, name of the collection, and name of the database. So it's a tuple. Oh, interesting. Okay, it, it, so it that's what in, I in the document. What I end up with is a list of those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. And okay. uh, and you you will see a few collections like here: house, window, and uh, door. Three collections uh, with with objects, separated objects. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. You can also um, tell it that you don't want to propagate those changes, right? If, as you save the house, which is interesting. Uh, let's talk about prefetch. So. Well, I, I told you one of the, when I see those websites that are just dragging super slow, I go through my thing. All right. Did they forget the index? <laughs> are, they, are they doing some terrible seven way join? Probably without indexes. Or the third thing, is it an N plus one ORM problem where they get one thing, but then they've got to go back and back and back because they're, yeah. they're touching this related field, which you could potentially run into that problem as well. So you have this prefetch idea, which is kind of like a, a joined load or, um, something like that, right? Yeah, yeah. It uses uh, lookup aggregation in terms of MongoDB. Uh, 
it's not just find query, but uh, aggregation, and it avoids this endless n plus one problem, yeah, as you said. Right. So you just and, do in your find, you just say fetch links equals true, and that'll mm -hmm. just go get the doors, the windows, everything in your house example, right? Yeah. And uh, I, I like the, the the speed of this. Like it's much faster than do it, you know, one by one. Yeah. Especially for list of objects. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so you also have the ability to say fetch all links retroactively if you've you're like, oh, I should have <laughs> should have done this join, but I didn't. Yeah. That might sound silly, right? Well, why not just always do the join, right? That's one, probably slower than not doing it, I would guess. And two, this is this happens to me all the time. Like, for example, on the courses website, I want to show I want to be able to get the courses, but the courses have like chapter information and other stuff inside of them. And then those have like links effectively over to say like all the details about each chapter, like the lectures and videos and all that. On say the page that lists the, the, the courses, I do not want those things. But on the, the course details page where it shows you like, here's all the stuff in the course and how long it is, like I definitely do want those things. So in my data access layer, I have a thing that says, should you get all the data or just the top level data, basically? And this would be exactly the code you write. Like, well, if you want all the data, you had say fetch all links on it, right? Yeah. Yeah, correct. Yeah. This is cool. Is there a way to do that on a set? Like this is on one record. Is there a way to say I got, I got 20 houses back, fetch all of their links? Or do I have to do it? Is that 20 calls? So it, it would be 20 calls, unfortunately. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. I think in my my example, it's also 20 calls or however many. The same setup is exactly the same. But um, but, but but I will improve it, I, I hope. Yeah. Now, this is this is worth pointing out. This is a brand new feature, right? You announced this as one of the, the new features uh, just two days ago. On right? Monday, yeah. Yeah. And for the people listening, we're recording on Wednesday morning. So, yeah, this is not... <laughs> this is like your first pass, but I really like how this looks with the relationships and the, the query and whatnot. It would be nice, I think, if you could have um, some way to kind of globally configure it to say, in general, if I call save, the the rule to write the the relationships is to not to do nothing or to always write them or something, and then only have to override it potentially. Yeah, yeah, sounds like default default rule. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That'd be pretty cool. So let's see, a few other things we could talk about. We talked a little bit about the event-based actions, but you want to just kind of, you know, talk about them directly because it was like a quick, well, how do I add my <laughs> default value? What's the, the overall picture with these default, uh, with these event actions? So yeah, a lot of, somehow a lot of people wanted this and- uh, I want I it. <laughs> <That's> good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I didn't know about this pattern before. Like, it's implemented some something like this implemented in uh, Active Rep Record pattern of okay. Ruby of Rails, and uh, so finally, I was inspired by this. I, I like this word "inspired by," mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> not not stolen, but inspired by. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, so and implemented this, yeah, and uh, now it's supported only uh, for types of events. There are events on each insert, replace, save changes, and validate on save. Uh, it creates an event and uh, two events before it called and after it called. Um, and based on these uh, events, actions already registered registered uh, to the document would be called also. It supports and uh, synchronous and asynchronous uh, methods for this. And uh, you can do a lot of stuff with this. Yeah, that's cool. You can put the decorator on just an async version or a non-async version and being able to just call it correctly, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. I'm guessing if you're not doing any awaits, it'd be better if it was not asynchronous, but it doesn't matter that much, right? It's uh, one and a half faster if it's not asynchronous. Yeah. Probably, but if it's if it's wait if yeah if it's doing something where it's waiting on something else then maybe it should be yeah okay N another feature that just came out is cache yeah cache uh, 
it's also interesting feature like uh, so yeah it's cache I don't know if I <laughs> have to explain what is cache. It's when you uh, it's when you save data somewhere locally and use a copy of uh, data for some time. Yeah, and uh, what you're talking about is not using MongoDB as a caching backend, but caching the queries that would run through Beanie to not hit the database again if it knows the answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, it's it's it's. Somehow it's really important feature, uh, even for my projects. Like for example, if you have to validate stuff with user, and uh, you already asked for a user in this application with this ID, but you don't know the place where you did it, and you don't want to provide this uh, object through you know the whole pipeline because probably it will not be used in the in the end of this pipeline. But user is already cached in in, in Bini, and uh, if you just will ask in the end of the pipeline about, again about the same user uh, data, so it would be there. And uh, with, with the bigger uh, find queries, it works the same way. Yeah, the more complicated the query, the better. Uh, this makes a lot of sense, I think, for data that doesn't change much. Like if you've got a bookstore, you might have categories and books, and maybe the books change often, the reviews of the books change often, the books that are in different categories change, but the categories themselves very rarely change, right? So that could be yeah. something like the category query could just be like, you know what, <laughs> this is cached. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So for now, it supports only only local cache, like uh, dictionaries of Python, but I plan to add another cache backends like mm, Redis and things like this. Yeah, that's cool. Or even... Possibly you could put, it might even make sense to use MongoDB itself as a cache. Um, yeah. Because it, what it, you're caching here is the, it's, I mean, it's be weird to kind of store the same thing back into it. But at the same time, if you've got a complicated query, what you're storing is like, these are the three things that came back from running that query against possibly hundreds of millions of records. <laughs> right. So in that yeah. case, it might make sense to just put it back in Mongo. So it's just a straight, you know, table scan reads. Something like Lambda architecture inside of the single database. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, your example says, okay, what we're going to do is say sample.find num greater than 10 to list. And then if you call it again with the caching on, then you get the same thing. Well, it looks at the, f the actual query, right? So if I said num greater than 11, I would get, that would be a separate result and a separate cached thing, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. Cool. The other thing I guess that's worth noting is you can set an expiration date on the cache, right? Like I want this to live for 10 minutes or whatever uh, mm -hmm. to get the answer back. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. Let's, uh, let's talk about revisions and then I'm going to propose one more idea that I think I could build out of revisions and events. So um, what are revisions? So it's mm, it's not my idea again. It's another okay. one user asked me for this. And I really like users of Bini because you know I have not that many ideas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, what, what what is this? Uh, you sometimes you have to protect a document inside of the database uh, of um, changes. So yeah, sometimes you have old version of the data in your backend, and you do some updates. And if you update your document with this old uh, data, you will lose data updated by another backend yeah. for the same document. And so let me let me give people some examples because yeah. I think understanding the context is really important. Like. It could be even the same function, basically, right? So I could have a, a function that do complicated things. I could say, get me my user object for the current user who wants to make some changes. I could call, do a bunch of work, call a function with the past, say, like the user ID over. Maybe that gets the user back, makes some changes, saves it mm -hmm. to the database. And then I go to the end, I make some more changes, not realizing that to my in-memory version, and then call save, and it overwrote what that intermediate function might have whatever it was there is gone now you know what i mean so you would want to know is there <laughs> is the thing that i got back if i'm going to replace it in the database is it still 
the same thing or somebody somewhere behind the scenes changed it. You know, often I think the people think about very complicated, well, some other process did some other thing, but it could just be some other part of your code that you didn't realize called save after a query. Yeah, yeah. And for this case, I'm using a revision ID, a special token, which uh, generates uh, each time when data saves into the database. And uh, when you, you know, save again, it will check if uh, this ID is the same or it's already updated. If it's updated, it will raise an error, like you, you have all data uh, in memory. But if it's the same, it will allow you to. Nice. That's really it's, cool. It's, that, it's, it's I think it's a great thing, it's... No, it's, it's good. It's good. It definitely is. You know, because the alternative of this pattern is to do a blocking transaction, yeah. right? Uh, and that's also potentially possible. I think MongoDB does have transactions now, but I still I haven't used them. I don't, I don't really have a use for that. But the alternative model in databases is to say, we're going to do a, a transaction that blocks and anyone else who tries to do a database thing whatsoever, they just wait <laughs> until we're yeah. done. And that way there's no chance of them seeing it in this intermediate state. Uh, a lot of the scalable systems don't end up doing that even in relational databases because this blocking model can really kill the concurrency. Yeah. Right. And so they end up doing optimistic concurrency with these types of revisions anyway. <laughs> it's it's just so I think it's a really cool pattern. I love it. Yeah, it is it's great. It's great. Yeah. Idea. It's it's pity it's not my idea, but it's great. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really good. It's also uh, I guess worth discussing like set and increment and those types of things. So if I say like I want to add a category to a product, I could do like um, add to set on that thing and pass the, just put this thing in its category list. Will that also increment the revision? Um, so only only set, I think, yeah. Uh, okay. Because if, if, if you will use like internal methods of MongoDB, it will not uh, understand that it, didn't, it, it need to update another field, yeah. Got it, okay, interesting. But yeah, that's a good feature, I like it. Uh, this is a big release. It's a huge one. <laughs> cool. Well, we've been talking for a long time. Uh, as you can tell, I'm very excited about it. Um, what else? What's coming next? So next, I have a big plans also. Uh, I really like Pydentic. I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Pydentic. You, you, can, you can see it. <laughs> but uh, for some cases, Pydentic is a heavy tool. And probably, I don't know uh, how I will implement it, but I want to uh, add support of uh, native Python data classes here or here or to separate it smaller project like Bini data classes. I don't know yet. Mm, but anyway, I, I have planned to to add uh, data classes without Pydentic there. Just with not the, the say uh, fancy parsing stuff without uh, that great validation stuff. But somewhere bit. in between, I just want to. You're just getting dictionaries back. Good luck, and you're getting Pydentic. Somewhere in the middle is you're getting classes back, but they don't necessarily. They're not as precise as say pedantic yeah uh, I, I, I mean there are cases and people uh, uses bini with these cases also when mm -hmm. you have a lot of a lot of uh, json huge JSONs uh, as a document and when you parse it on a fashion uh, it keeps a lot of time yeah so it takes a lot, a lot of time for that just for parsing and then for encoding back to dictionary to store this uh, dictionary yeah. it's not it's not pedantic fault definitely because pedantic is, is again it's great uh, but uh, i need to avoid this uh, step somehow and probably probably i will uh, use um, data classes for this sure they look very similar yeah. Another scenario where I find that Pydantic is not a good fit is where I might be getting bad data, but I don't want it just to be an exception. I want to be able to get all the bad data and say, here's the three errors that you made passing me this data. And uh, I'm not going to accept it, but but here's what you gave me. You know, um, if you're doing like form exchange, right? Like mm -hmm. from um, an HTML form. Yeah. 
what you need to do is put the old value back in and say that value right there, that's wrong. <laughs> but with Pydantic, if you get the value from the form and you mm -hmm. try to read it, it's just going, no, it's wrong. And you're like, wait, but I need to give it back to them. Just don't run away. Come back. Where'd you go? And so there's situations like that where, where you need to kind of keep that exchange going, but you, you still want some sort of, you just got to do the validation yourself. But anyway, there's certainly times where Pydantic is as cool as it is, is not the right fit for that situation. Yeah. Yeah. Do agree. Totally. Yeah. Good example. Nice. Thanks. All right. Well, Romana, this is a very cool project. I've, as you hinted at earlier, I've seen it from the beginning, at least when you open sourced it, and it's really come a long ways. It's it's super compelling. It looks like something that I could possibly use on my next project. I'm constantly, as many people out there are, I'm, I'm sure as you are, I'm constantly resisting the urge to go, you know, I should rewrite that. I should rewrite that in fast API, or I should rewrite that in this. <laughs> you know, I should rewrite my Mongo engine stuff with Beanie. But, you know, maybe one day I'll break down and do it. It would be fun. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's... <laughs> yeah, very cool. So nice work on this project. Um, you're looking for contributors and PR. Would you be PRs? Would you be happy to have I... people make contributions? I make a bunch of issues now. A lot of, lot of uh, people found some something doesn't fit to, uh, to different use cases. And so yes, it would be it would be great to to have other contributors here. I already uh, have like fifteen contributors. Nice. Yeah, yeah, that's and, cool. I saw uh, there's quite a few people in the uh, each one is, sidebar is there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, cool. uh, but 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 I need more, more and more, <laughs> <laughs> and especially for documentation because uh, I, don't, I don't know I I really much better in Python than in English. <laughs> and uh, documentation is my weak point here. Okay, cool. Well, definitely a neat project. So thank you for building it. Now, before you get out of here, you have to answer the final two questions. If you're going to write some Python code, what editor are you using these days? What did you use to create Beanie with, for example? I'm, I'm using uh, PyCharm. Mm -hmm. JetBrains also gave me a uh, pro version for Beanie uh, as a support program, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah and fantastic. It's, it's, it's a really great tool. For, I, I'm expecting new new one. I don't remember the name of, but so they, they, ha, uh, they, has new, they have new idea. I don't remember the name. Fleet, Fleet, yeah. Yeah, I was about to mention Fleet. Fleet is interesting. Fleet is like JetBrains' response to uh, VS Code. Yeah, I'm I'm exactly. pretty excited about it. You know, I really love PyCharm. Is you know, nobody's gonna be surprised that I say that. But if I've got just one file, like I'm gonna open that in VS Code because all the ID, all the JetBrains IDE tools, they expect like a project and they're gonna create all these things. I'm like, I just want to look at the files, just just the files, just please, like just not too much. And this is kind of like that, uh, where you can later turn on some of the IDE features, right? It looks pretty cool. You gonna yeah. try it out? Not yet. I I, I asked for the, for it, but so JetBrains, if you hear me, please. yes, exactly, <laughs> JetBrains. I'm already on the early access list too, and I don't have an email. Maybe I haven't checked it this morning. Maybe it, maybe it's there. <laughs> <laughs> so, Fantastic. Uh, yeah. All right. So uh, PyCharm, maybe Fleet in the future potentially. Cool. Uh, and then notable PyPI package. I mean, we've talked about a bunch oh. of libraries already. Yeah, so I really like one. It's not it's not about identity or fast API stuff, but I really I really it's a great package uh, called Yaru, Y A R L. Yeah, uh, it's like um, it, it, it's like a pass library, but for URLs, and it's great. You can you can combine uh, strings with this URL stuff together, and uh, you can parse it. You can oh, that's cool. Yeah, so you can pass it a, a URL as a string, just like whatever you'd expect. But then you can say, "Give me the scheme," which is like HTTP, HTTPS, the host, the path, the query string. 
yeah. I, I, re I really I really like how they use this divide operator uh, you probably see uh, in the bottom of your page now mm -hmm. like URL divide full divide bar oh um, interesting it's uh it's like pathlib style it's like pathlib yeah it's like pathlib for URLs and it's cool. it's, it's super great all right this is totally new to me awesome good recommendation <laughs> good recommendation yeah I, I use it in each project now it's Cool. I, I, I don't know how to live without this. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm, I'm going to check it out for sure. Uh, one quick final up from uh, follow from the audience here. Uh, Mario says, thank you for this project. I'm about to launch my fast API beanie blog soon. Couldn't have done it without it. Thank you. Yeah. And, and Ollie's on it. He says, uh, pathlibs for URLs. Indeed, it's pathlib for URLs. Cool. That's a great one. All right. Final call to action. People want to get started with beanie. What do you say? Uh, I would say have a fun. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I, I would recommend that people go and check out the, if you go to the documentation, there's a tutorial that walks you through this pretty well uh, right yeah. there on the left. It just starts by defining a document and then initialization and so on. Yeah, yeah. We, we try to do this as much um, simple to understand as yep. possible. Fantastic. All right, Roman, thank you for being here. Thank you very much for, for being here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Everyone out watching this on YouTube, thank you so much for being here. All of you who asked questions, that was really great. And if you enjoyed it, be sure to like the video and subscribe to hear about more. See y'all.